Part 2, Habits of Heart and Mind, Lesson 7, Mindfulness. A year and a half ago, I made a video and told people that with that idea of taking a year off for my treatments, that I was going to treat it like a kind of sabbatical. And I don't really know what I had in mind, uh, what kind of sabbatical it would be, but I have to tell you that I didn't, I wasn't able to read. I didn't have the concentration to read. I didn't have the attention span to like listen to podcasts or watch videos. I couldn't even really listen to music. I spent um, hour upon hour, day upon day, week upon week, just wanting stillness and silence. And what it really ended up being was a sabbatical and mindfulness and meditation. And when I just use the word mindfulness, I mean as in minding the mind. And let me tell you why. When I let my thoughts run amok, they took me places, my thoughts took me places I did not want to go. I'd be thinking, what are the new ways that multiple myeloma is going to show up in my body? And how am I going to become further debilitated as time goes on? I think about death and dying and honest to God, I'd, I'd see like all these like people that I love in front of me and try to imagine, you know, saying goodbye to each one of them. Really nice way to spend an afternoon, right? I don't think so. So I had a daily deliberate choice, control my thoughts or be controlled by them. And what I'm really talking about here is the imagination. The imagination is so powerful. It can so hold us up or it can so bring us down. And it has an amazing power to freak us out in a way that life could never match. Why? Because we're the keepers of our deepest fears, our vulnerabilities. We're the ones who can name the demons that we wrestle with that in Jungian psychology, they call the shadow self. I feel like we own the secret ammunition to just scare the shit out of ourselves. But we also have the power to harness the imagination on the power of good. And I'd like to talk about two tools in our personal arsenal that are always immediately accept accessible to each of us. And those would be breath and attention. By simply paying attention to the breath, the rise of the inhale, the fall of the exhale, just even three times, whoa, we're back in the body and we are in the present. Now, unlike the government that has a separation of church and state, sometimes as human beings, we have a false separation like we can't be in body and mind, body and spirit and heart. But we have the ability to be in the body as a breathing presence and then focus our thoughts and our spirit in a life-affirming direction. This is what most people call meditation. And I found out that there's an endless variety of meditations. I certainly enjoyed the classics with, you know, the meditation rock stars, Deepak Chopra, Pema Chodron, Jack Kornfield, you know, with the ethereal music and the bells and the mantra. Those were lovely. But what I enjoyed much more, the one that was really compelling for me, was watching the birds at the feeder seeing the little chickadees, you know, fly in from branch to branch, and then whoo, in flies a nut hatch, and then here comes the purple finch. Who needs Netflix with all this action going on? This meditation was second only to what I call the sky-watching meditation. You're just watching the wind through the trees, or the movement of clouds across the sky, or the changing of colors throughout the day. On Tuesdays, I would feel really good because Wednesday was my chemo day. So by Tuesday, I was actually able to listen to music. And I would call up classic rock on Amazon and 
be totally carried away, you know, by Bob Seger, Bruce Strings Springsteen, the Dire Straits, the Beatles. And what I found is that music is its own magic carpet if you can go along for the ride. And it will take you down old forgotten streets and back to younger selves that had stars in her eyes and big hopes in her heart. So here's what I found that while in this kind of meditation, fear and worry and distress, sadness could come up, but they had no foothold. They themselves were like clouds passing in a larger sky of consciousness. I didn't have to identify with those negative feelings. I could feel sadness without being sadness. I don't think that meditation is meant for us to like ignore or deny our emotions and feelings. They have a place. The point is not to identify them, identify with them, but to be able to observe them like a storm passing through. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I never found fighting a storm in the world very effective. And I don't think fighting the internal storms are any less futile. But we do have a way. We, we can gather ourselves and not become the darkness. Um, I remember with the, I had the sudden onset of shingles just days before I was to be admitted to the hospital for a bone marrow transplant, which could postpone the transplant conceivably for weeks or months. And I was, the only word I can say is totally distraught. And I let myself go there. And no one was going to jolly me out of it either. You know those times where you just feel so self-righteous and just like cursing the universe, right? And I found that I was struck with a one-word vocabulary, and it started with F. And even at that time, there was a part of me noticing, whoa, this isn't just a thunderstorm, Denise. This is a tornado. But what I also knew is that tornadoes pass. So if I didn't fight it and I didn't take myself too seriously, it would pass. And I'm happy to tell you that it did. And my um, a wider, more scintillating, less crass vocabulary returned to me. I just want to mention, I think there's one other very, very sweet reward of mindfulness, um, something that I learned over time is that there is within, I believe, each of us, a place of stillness and of sanctuary. And everyone has a different way of entering that temple. Some, it's being in nature, or maybe it's music or candles. For me, just reading one beautiful Mary Oliver poem or a piece of prose by John O'Donohue will put me in that place of reverence we usually think of as a place of prayer. But what is prayer? But that place where we shut out the noise of the world so we can hear the holy, to just breathe and be thankful to have breath in this body, in this person, on this planet, at this time. To me, that is the highest form of meditation. And whatever takes you there, go there as often as you can. Number six, a lesson in grace, being here now. It's been kind of interesting for me to have lessons that I've taught in the past as a trainer come up for me kind of fresh and difficult to put into practice uh, in my present life. And one of those lessons is that idea of the past and the future being absolute thieves of the present moment. So it's like we have a foot in the past and a foot in the future, and we're straddling dimensions of time that aren't even really here. With the foot in the past, it's like, oh, I wish I had, you know, my old life again. My life was so sweet before cancer. I want to go back. So there's like regret and grief. Or there's the foot in the future that's like, what's my life going to look like down the line? And that's just full of worry. And what's missing is the grace of the present moment. So I learned a really cool thing from Eckhart Tolle, who said, 
when you're feeling great distress or worry, you need to know that you are out of the present. You, you're either in the past or you're in the future because that's where distress and worry thrive, much less so in the present moment. So it's a really simple, cool suggestion. When you find yourself in that place, have the wherewithal to simply ask this question. Am I okay in this moment? And almost always the answer is yes, I'm fine, we're fine. And it's like having the wherewithal to ask that question is like um, taking a mental or emotional eraser to judgment or melodrama about what is happening. And we cease being um, a victim of circumstance, which of course is the petri dish for distress and worry. And in that present moment, am I okay? Yes, I am. That's why I would feel the present of grace. That's where she lives. So there were times um, when I was undergoing, you know, uncomfortable medical procedures or whatever, where I would ask the question, am I okay in this moment? And it kind of rang less than true, but it never felt like a lie. It felt like a promise. You will be fine in very short order. Don't get me wrong, you've heard me say in other lessons on this video that I had those moments that were pretty dark and it was when even the concept of being in the present moment felt like pure and utter bullshit. Oh, I could mock the concept with the best of them, but guess who was the one to pay the price? Me. There is yet uh, another reward of uh, being in the moment now that I have found that's really kind of cool. I've become a collector of moments. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I'll find myself, you know, when I'm in laughter or tears, you know, joy or reconnection. And it's like there's someone on tiptoe inside me who is not going to let those moments slip through the stream of my consciousness without notice. It's almost like I just kind of grab them and put them in this jar inside of me. I've been a collector of many things throughout my life. Birds, nests, feathers, flowers, lanterns, stars, colored glass. But I'm much less interested now um, in collecting beautiful items, and I'm more interested in collecting beautiful moments. And if you guys think about it, it's those moments that really shape the treasure that is our lives. I hope that if I am so lucky as to live into a cure for multiple myeloma, which by the way is my plan, my hope is that I never lose this beautiful sensibility to collect the moments. Number seven, a lesson in gratitude the ultimate anchor. Did you ever hear the story of the grandmother who takes her little grandson to the beach and the little boy goes a little too close to the water when a wave comes in and whoop, sweeps him out to the sea? She's frantic, she's panicked, and she pleads, oh God, please just return my grandson. I'll do, I'll be anything just to have my grandson back. And with the next incoming wave, whoop, plops her grandson right in front of her, no worse for the wear. She looks up and she says, um, excuse me, he was wearing a hat. Oh my God, could we be a more ungrateful, fickle species? We're never content with what we have. No, there's something else that we want, but then as soon as we get it, then of course we want something else and all the while we're in pursuit of a happiness we never really get because we can't simply be content with where we have and where we are. Here's, I'm not telling you anything new here, here's the truth. Wherever we are in life, it is a reflection of where we are in our thoughts, what we're focused on, the wavelength that we are tuned into. And here's the truth, we very seldom have control over our external circumstances. What we do have control over is the lens through which we are perceiving it and the story that we're telling ourselves about it. And I think of gratitude as like a really cool lens 
to put on any circumstance we're in. I feel like wherever we are, we're always at an entry point. We're always at a threshold that's inviting a larger perspective. Gratitude can bring us that larger perspective and put the most positive spin on a situation. Now, you guys, I'm not talking about false spin like politicians who, you know, are trying to manipulate their voters. What I'm talking about is taking control of the narrative. So you are authoring your own story. So I kind of feel that this is important for everyone in any circumstances that you learn how to tune into the wavelength of gratitude, like a wavelength on a radio. But my friends, it is particularly important when you have been through something that is really jarring, what's pulled the rug out from underneath you and sent you into orbit, you know, those big challenges. And cancer for me was that big challenge. And I can honestly say, I don't know where I would be this last year and a half without gratitude as my loyal companion. And you know what? I know what you're thinking. Well, you know, there's different kinds of people. There's like the Pollyanna type who see through rose-colored glasses. And then there's like the Darth Vader types who, you know, focus into the dark. Almost as if being grateful is a character trait or like a quality. And I just have to say, I don't see it that way at all. It is a choice. It is a muscle. It is a muscle that needs, like any other muscle, needs work and and practice until it becomes an anchor set on your heart or your consciousness to really look at what is good how am i blessed in this situation so listen to the difference between what i need a bone marrow camp transplant and really i qualify for a bone marrow transplant that's going to be provided by me through my health care providers at a hospital 20 minutes from my house? Now, here's the thing. Both questions are valid. Yeah, I think that we're both Darth Vader and Pollyanna. And I don't think we're wired to immediately see the good in a situation with our first thought. But here's one of the privileges of being human. We don't have to start at the first thought. We have the privilege of a second thought. Oh my God, I'm going to lose my hair. Wow, isn't that great that it's going to grow back? <laughs> so as you know, life is so ironic. Sometimes it takes darkness to know light. Uh, we need noise to know silence and sadness to know happiness, illness to know health. One of the most beautiful things about gratitude, it is the bestower of beautiful questions. And I will tell you this, change your question, you will totally change your world. So I'd like to share with you three questions I've lived with in the last year and a half. Three beautiful questions bestowed by gratitude. First one, what if I were to focus more on the wonders of this body rather than its flaws? How many freaking mind-boggling processes are taking place at all times in this body that I do not have to orchestrate or even like understand to begin with? What kind of miracle is this body? Here's a second question. How have I learned through this time how rich my circle is, how loved I am by family and friends and my work community? Am I not the richest person in the universe? Third question, what would have happened if I had not lived in a country with universal health care? What if I'd been self-employed with some funky kind of insurance plan rather than in a place like Canada where I have been given incredible care for free? You know what? On that grounds alone, I ought to kneel and kiss the ground for the rest of my life. My friends, change your questions. You change your world. I just want to share with you that I um, have chemo pills that I would put into a little heart. 
um, before taking them and I would just say a quick little blessing thank you for all the people through the generations through all your research and hard work to have found your medicinal powers do no harm thank you for the good you're going to do for me listen to how different okay and now I'm going to take the poison that's going to kill not just the bad cells but the good ones and make me sick for a week my god you guys those thoughts alone are going to kill you just take this idea Whatever situation you're in, ask the question. What is the question gratitude would pose? Number eight, a lesson in graciousness, the gift we give back. This lesson is kind of a twin sister to number seven, gratitude. It's been really quite mind-blowing to be on the receiving end of so much kindness and so much generosity from so many people. Little did I know how challenging it would be to be on the receiving end. If I heard it one time, I heard it a million times. You know, Denise, you've always been the giver. This is your time to receive. And it's not that I don't appreciate the sentiment. What I just want to say is that's a whole lot harder than I think a lot of people imagine it is if you've not ever been in that place. We like being the givers. <laughs> We like being the one who show up for other people, but to all of a sudden have the tables turned and find that you can't really cope without the help of many, it is really humbling. And I think that graciousness is an important capacity and it was hard for me to cultivate graciousness. It was hard to be on the receiving end, but it's important because that's the gift we give the gift that we give back to the people who were showing up for us. And it made me think about all these people throughout my life who I showed up for, who gave me that gift. And little did I know how humbling that was for them and what largesse they had of spirit in order to let me show up in that way. I've also learned that there is um, um, so many creative ways that people find to give. I'd like to name just a few of them. My sister-in-laws came over and helped me plant 2,000 tulip bulbs in my backyard, knowing there was no way I could do it myself. So there are five of us, like five hours of work, an amazing gift. One of my friends put together the meal train. There's a, a website that's available to anyone for free. And you have people, local people sign up, you know, to deliver dinner on certain nights. And oh my God, it was so fun. It was, uh, we did it for three nights a week. And it was like three nights a week. It was like Christmas opening up that door. Really, really cool. Um, there was one of my friends who started a GoFundMe, um, not for medical expenses, but for knowing that I was going to be without income for that year for like personal care um, expenses. Another one of my friends became my NFA coach because she kept telling me, you're not effing around here, Denise. And my chemo would be on Wednesdays and I'd get a pep talk from her on Wednesday mornings. You go in there, girl, you put on that cape, you're a warrior spirit. And she made me feel so badass. There's another friend who continues to send me daily dedications that are like prayers or intentions to really keep my eye on the ball. Another friend from across the country sent me something called Grace Notes. So it would be like an email full of like links to videos or interviews or songs that would like fill my spirit. And then, oh, there's the soup angel across the fence. One of my neighbors would bring me homemade soup every Tuesday. And then, of course, there were the visits from my family. My daughter came twice from Los Angeles, waited on me hand and foot. My sisters, each of them from California, came for a time. My brother from Wisconsin, my aunt from Boston, my 93-year-old father traveled from California to be with me. And I just want to say here that when you have cancer, your family has cancer. It is as present in their life as this chair is present in this room. And it's not easy to deal with 
various family members' reactions when you're just trying to keep on an even keel. And I have to say, I always work to present my most positive, optimistic self, not just because I'm upholding my hope, but I'm trying to uphold theirs. The downside of that is that I've been less than forthcoming with some of the losses and some of the grief that have come with the experience. And so I've needed to bring those, find other places to share those. And I know it's true for them. They also have loss. They also have grief and fear. And I'm so glad that they have one another. It's so important. Now, I can't be talking about gratitude and graciousness without talking about my husband, who has been every step of the road with me. I remember one time I said, Honey, thank you for taking me to chemo. And he looked a little bit hurt, and he said, I didn't take you to chemo. We went to chemo together. This is our journey, babe. And I would tell you that my husband, Rob, does not identify with the word caregiver. That's just not an identity he, he would, you know, take on. He would say, I've just been a loving and attentive husband. The truth is that he's been my caregiver and my husband, and that has been a challenge. I didn't want him feeling like he was living with a patient. I wanted to still feel like I was his wife. So um, at, I, I would purposely get dressed during the day so I wasn't in my pajamas all the time. And I would kind of want to look pretty when we get together for supper and a movie at the end of the day. Even um, at the hospital, when, when I knew he was coming, I could almost hear my mother's words, freshen up. You know, and I'd want to put on like a little bit of lipstick or some earrings. And it, it cracks me up to think about it because I know that I looked like death warmed over. But I wanted to make those little tiny any gestures that would say, honey, I'm still your wife. It's an interesting dance. So to all of you who at this present time are bringing your generous, your generosity and your kindness or caregiving other people, I just want to say to you, you know, we all want to pay it forward. And I always made that promise and I still plan to hold to that promise of paying it all forward. But to all of you in that position, I just hope that it all comes back to you a thousandfold. Thank you.